What's up, guys? I'm Jared Lopes, and you're listening to the Dad Tired Podcast, where I'm helping everyday families learn how to follow Jesus in everyday life. How's it going, guys? Jared Lopes back here with you on the Dad Tired Podcast. If you have yet to pick up the Dad Tired devotional that a bunch of guys are going through, I would highly recommend grabbing a couple guys, maybe two, three. It's best to go with like two or three, maybe four other guys uh, to go through the devotional. It's only 28 days, and I did that on purpose because I've, I've always hated growing up in church when somebody said, hey, do you want to like be my accountability partner? Partner, or Do you want to meet with me every week or let's meet every week? And then it was just like this indefinite period of time where we would meet and eventually it phase out and then it's awkward like you'd meet four times five times over several months or whatever and then you're just like okay now we're talking about the same things over and over i don't really know why we're doing this anymore and then you just start making excuses and you start stop showing up and then it's awkward the friendship's awkward all that stuff so i try to, <laughs> that's probably just deeper stuff going on in my heart uh, that I need to work out. <clears throat> anyway, the reason I purposely did it for 28 days is so you can just like say, hey, do you want to meet four times? Um, you want to meet just this month? Talk about what it would look like for the gospel to affect, to change, to influence, to impact our marriage, um, our hearts, our the way that we parent, and what it looks like for us at work. So that's the whole point of the Dad Tired Devotional. It's 28 days. Uh, it's very readable. I made it so it can be about 10 minutes a day. Anyway, you can pick that up at dadtired.com. Click the devotional tab. Also, if you're not part of our online community, we've got a closed Facebook group. It's guys only. Um, we'd love to have you come be a part of that. We have several thousand men from around the world who are taking their faith, their family, and their marriage very seriously. We, we really would love to have you come hang out and be part of that. As I've mentioned a couple weeks ago, um, we're going to be doing dad tired one day meetups. So I'll come into different cities ac across the country. We'll meet together with a bunch of guys at churches and we'll talk about what does it mean for the gospel to impact our lives and our marriage. We'll just spend a whole day discussing that, talking about that, brainstorming together, dreaming together, uh, and all that fun stuff. So uh, the dad tired Facebook group is a good way to meet other guys in that area. It's also a way to find out like are other, uh, are we doing any one day meetups in your area? <clears throat> um, so anyway, that's a good reason to go be part of that today on the, the podcast. I've got a super cool guest. I've been waiting like months to have these guys on. It's John and Tim from the Bible project. They start, they're actually based here in Portland. I've, I've had a chance to hang out with them and go, explore their offices and see all the stuff they're doing in the office, which is really fun. Um, but the Bible project, man, it's a, I, I, I followed, I started following Tim who's part of, he, he helped um, start the Bible project. Uh, I, I started following him like years ago. He was just like putting up, it looked like no offense, Tim. And I know you're probably listening to this, but he was putting up like videos way back in the day. It looked like just like his Nokia phone. He was recording <laughs> It was higher quality than that, but it was just, you know, these low budget videos where he was just explaining each, I think he called them Bible in five, where he would explain each book of the Bible in five minutes or less. And they were so helpful as a young teacher. When I was starting to teach the Bible, I would watch these videos because they were so helpful. Um, and so from, to go from that over the years to now the Bible project, which goes through each Bible in the, or each, uh, yeah, goes through each book of the Bible and talks about uh, the theme of the book, how it fits into the overall story of what God's doing throughout the uh, the entire scriptures. Man, it's just so, so good. If you have not heard of the Bible Project or checked out their videos, you must do it today. I'll link it in the show notes. But anyway, uh, they were super gracious to take some time out of their day and to come hang out with us and to answer some questions about the Bible and also just them being dads and husbands and all that good stuff. So anyway, without further ado, here's my interview with Tim and John from The Bible Project. All right, John and Tim, thank you guys so much for hanging out today. For the like two listeners who have never heard of The Bible Project, uh, give, <laughs> us a, give us a short introduction on what you guys are doing these days. Sure. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Yeah. We are in Portland, Oregon, and we're making uh, a whole library of animated videos that walk through themes of the Bible and the structure of biblical books in the Bible, showing how all scripture is one unified story and how it has its climax in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we've we've done about 100 videos mm -hmm. um, and we've got a bunch more we want to do. We're a, a YouTube channel and then we have a website 
the Bible Project, but also a YouTube channel. Um, and it's a crowdfunded animation studio, nonprofit. So it's all like viewer supported. Yeah. We're making these videos. It's great. Yeah. And you guys aren't just like in a garage making some videos with like a little, like your iPhone or something. You're doing them like really, really, really well. Like <laughs> yeah. how, did, how did you come to the point where you are now where you get, you've got a whole team of people who are putting together these videos really, really well done? Yeah. Uh, well, we started out with um, just a few guys that were freelancers for us. Mm-hmm. And Tim and I had other jobs, and we just did this on mm-hmm. the side. So your other job was work making short yeah. animated. Videos. I have a lot of experience making these yeah. kind of videos before uh, companies, primarily. Yeah, explaining their products yeah. and their software and their services. <laughs> and so I really already had the network of people who could do it, knew how the process works. I enjoy explaining things. I enjoy visually explaining things. So. Uh, to start small, we just, mm-hmm. it was just Tim and I doing it on the side and then hiring animators and illustrators as we needed it. And we had enough money to make two videos. We did that. And then we just asked everyone, Hey, if you want more of these, we need some more money. Right. <laughs> and, um, and then people gave us money. And people gave us money. To so make- then we made more and then people gave us money, made more. And then it got to the point where, uh, there was enough monthly f- income flow where we could hire people. And then we just started actually building out a studio. And um, we our, our goal was to get it so we can release um, enough content that people felt good about mm. giving us m- money every month. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like th- yeah, thinking it, thinking of it like a subscription. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's all, you know, volunteer. It's like a pay it forward subscription. Pay for it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, right. so we watch it for free. But if you want to help us in the long run, make a ton of stuff. And, yeah. And people really have, people have gotten behind us. It's yeah. Been super really, generous. Really fun to see how many generous people are in the world. It's yeah. remarkable. And yeah. when we were hanging out a couple months ago, you had said, I think, what did you say? The Philippines was like a one of your major supporters. Like you have people all over the world who are benefiting from these videos. Yeah. And it's not yeah. just people it, here in the States, right? Yeah. Half the views come internationally for us. Um, our support wise is probably mostly in the States, but hmm. a lot of support internationally. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So right. it's been cool. We didn't really expect that at all. And so now we got a whole initiative to translate videos in new languages. And yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> I was just, sorry to interrupt you. I, I was just down in um, Nicaragua a couple weeks ago and mm-hmm. we were working with these group of pastors who were, they're the mosquito people and they're, they're kind of a tribe in, mm. in Nicaragua and they speak mosquito, uh, which is a, a nothing's translated in their dialect. I think they just got their Bible translated into their dialect, but um, like a very last minute before we went there, we thought let's, let's try to visualize there. It's a very visual culture, like really every culture. And so we thought, what if we, we could bring some pictures to kind of tell the story of God from Genesis to revelation. And Mm. we just found these, like, I mean, it looked kind of like clip art. Like, I mean, it was real basic, Um, but man, they they had never seen like visuals of scripture Mm -hmm. before. And mm-hmm. to see them engage with these like visual aspects of scripture after mm-hmm. e- each session was just, mm-hmm. I, it's crazy how much we take it for granted, but it makes sense to me like that you have so many people internationally doing it, maybe for yeah. the first time seeing scripture visually. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I'm going to hit you up next time when we go and ask for some visuals because you guys <laughs> are way better than what we took. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we, I was also going to let you know that we have a, we've got like 75, over 75 guys from our dad tired community from all over the world who are going through the um, Bible project one year reading plan through scripture. Oh, oh sweet. Cool. Yeah. So oh, that's, that's been, cool. that's been pretty cool just to see them interact with each other online uh, yeah. and reading scripture together and using the Bible project. My wife and I are doing it as well. But that mm. kind of leads me into the, this next question. Uh, mm. uh, all throughout Scripture, studying Scripture is obviously an ancient practice. What, what are some differences between like studying Scripture in 2018, especially for the majority of us in like you know America, Western culture, compared mm. to like what what did studying Scripture look like 500 years ago, a thousand years ago? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think it is more difficult. Uh, if we're just talking about living in the modern West, I think it is more difficult. Um, the whether it's educational systems 
where the, just the cultural waters that we swim in don't um, easily foster um, uh, periods of time in our lives on any kind of regular basis to read and then reflect deeply on what you've read. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just, that's just not the American lifestyle right. anymore. Um, there was an era when it was the way of things. Um, if you, and I remember this, or I forget, it was it was something uh, that Ray Lubeck, uh, Professor John and I both had in college. Um, uh, Neil Postman, it's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Oh, right, yeah. Um, and it was kind of, it was a modern, it was a 90s analysis, in the 90s, before mm. smartphones. <laughs> yeah, before Facebook. Of mostly just TV, television culture that I grew up in, in like the 80s and 90s, of how much more dumb our public discourse is. Mm. And I remember he had this whole chapter where he, he had excerpts of quotations from presidential public speeches. Wow. <laughs> And they were so complex. Uh, and these speeches that, like, Lincoln would make, really long, are, like, lines of logical reasoning and argument, all these allusions to biblical and literature. <laughs> yeah. And he was just saying that was the listening public mm. of America in the 1800s was a really thoughtful audience. Mm. And then he's just de watching the decline. So all that to say... Like multiply that by Twitter, <laughs> right. Facebook, yeah. and like we're just not set up well yeah. to read and think about what we read. Yeah. Um, and so that's one. That's a big difference. You know, when the Bible was produced in cultures without any of that stuff. Yeah. And all they had was their traditional poems, their traditional stories, their traditional literature, and that that was all they would read and talk and think about around the fire, and in in the classrooms and. So it's just totally different. <laughs> yeah, even, even that kind of picture that you just painted, is there a difference like between community study of scripture versus independent study, like personal oh. Bible quiet time versus like yeah. a community gathering around to study God's word? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, I'm also rediscovering that in a new way. Mm. Of I've joined uh, a learning community of some friends and I who have gone through school together over the years, graduate school, and we're kind of rejoining our efforts hmm. to meet together a few times a year and commit to reading t together throughout the year. Uh, it's completely changing my learning <laughs> experience. Hmm. And this is just in the last couple of years. I'm like rediscovering it personally. Yeah. Um, and in a way, I mean, John could speak to this, what we're doing with this project is yeah. Essentially, John and I reading the Bible and thinking about it together over yeah. years now. Yeah, because the church that I grew up in, you you were told to as a spiritual practice to read the Bible by yourself, mm -hmm. it's your quiet time, mm -hmm. and um, and I always found that very difficult um, because I would usually just get confused um, more more often than not, and that would just be discouraging for me mm. and. Um, and so I kind of gave up trying to read the Bible by myself. Um, and uh, re and so reading the Bible mm. as part of this project has been, mm. yeah, really, really good for me. Mm -hmm. um, and we even did a video called The Public Reading of Scripture, yeah. which is tracing that theme of communities coming together to read the Bible, specifically at times when their imagination needs to be reshaped as a community yeah. to see what God is up to. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we've been really encouraged to, to make that something we, something we tell mm -hmm. other people to get behind mm -hmm. is get some friends together and, mm -hmm. and read this in a community. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys are dads, right? <laughs> yeah. In fact, we all, I think we all have yeah. uh, children really close in age, four and six, seven and eight. John, you're just seven, eight. Yeah, four and eight, six. Yeah. Four and six. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you guys are putting out all kinds of incredible resources for us to study God's word. Like, but what, in your home, <laughs> what do you, <laughs> what do you personally do to teach your guys' as kids scripture? Like, how do you study God's word in your houses? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm discovering what a new template looks like. Because yeah. I, um, my parents are incredible people, and they follow Jesus. Um, they also were reacting against their own super strict religious upbringings, mm -hmm. 
So they didn't they didn't do a lot that was habit forming or not that I remember. Yeah. So I don't have a lot to go off from my own childhood. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, however, uh, my kids love stories like most human beings. And so uh, for this season, when they're so young, I just am really trying to make stories about Jesus come alive. So whether it's reading them or just retelling them, I'll, and I'll just, you know, paint in a lot more detail. <laughs> yeah. But I, um, I'm waiting on all of the violent sex scandal type stories. I'm committed to not white- introducing them to whitewashed, yeah, biblical characters. I don't think that's going to help them because yeah. I'm just they're going to get one version of a story from their childhood that hardly resembles the actual story in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. whether it's Noah's Ark, but like minus the whole point of that story, which <laughs> is a terrible act of judgment. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of just sticking with Jesus stories for these young ages, and mm. I'll get to the other ones when they can watch the videos <laughs> and comprehend them a little more. But I don't know. That might not be the right approach. I might regret that in a few years, but <laughs> that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've been punting. I mean, my oldest is six, and so now I'm. It's probably entering a new season, but um, mm. I uh, I've been trying to just create like a um, an excitement and a mystery of like when you're older, we can talk about these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, I mean, they learn from Sunday school about Jesus and heaven and different things. And so they'll come and we'll talk about it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as far as actually like opening up and reading Bible stories, um, I haven't been doing that. They've watched our videos and we'll talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really funny. Actually, Paxton the other day came up to me. We were talking about where Jesus lives. Oh, and my four-year-old said, yeah, Jesus is in the clouds. And I was like, oh, I wonder where he picked that up. And um, <laughs> and and I was like, well, yeah, sort of. I mean, I guess. And then so Paxton was like, well, where is Jesus? I was like, well, Jesus is in heaven. Where's heaven? And um, oh, oh, I bring this up because Paxton said, you should know because you tell people about the Bible. And I was like, <laughs> we, we don't really talk about that. Like he just kind of picked that up from yeah. It's amazing how kids can pick up. So yeah. I need to be more proactive now because my kids are mm. getting mm. way smarter than I give them credit. Mm. And um, mm. yeah, but I was introduced very young and it wasn't helpful for me. Like mm. I had to unwind a bunch of things um, that I learned when I was five or six years old because mm. um, I said a prayer when I was five mm. and I would learn about all these characters in the Bible and I got bored of them really fast Mm -hmm. really fast to the point where it's like you're bringing up that again and Mm -hmm. I would just check out yeah so yeah yeah I'm such a pendulum too far I think that's such a shame I agree I'm so I'm kind of like I can't wait to really I want to make it feel epic when yeah when it because it is epic yeah I want to wait till they're able to really handle an epic narrative yeah that will like take a long time to to tell them, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so one like you, you had mentioned, you just mentioned this, John. Like I, in my upbringing too, it was that you said you had to kind of undo a lot of stuff that you were taught as a young kid. I remember, you know, six, seven years old, being taught I needed to say a prayer mainly mm-hmm. so that I can escape hell. Like if you don't want to go to hell, yeah. you need to say mm-hmm. a prayer. You could die at any time. That was real big in my church. You know, what mm-hmm. if you die today? You want to spend forever with Jesus in heaven. Uh, and I know you guys have done videos and podcasts on this, like mm. heaven and hell, the opposite to that mm. stuff. But as our kids start to hear mm. language about heaven, mm. hell, or even, you know, mm. it's not, it wouldn't be crazy for our kids in public school in Portland uh, for them to say, for one of their friends to say, well, do you think I'm going to hell, you know, in the next two years, two, three years for our kids yeah. to hear that? Mm. Like, how, how do we teach heaven mm. and hell to our six, seven, eight year olds? Mm. My my six year old thinks about it a lot. Like, mm. well, I don't know how often he thinks about it, but he's mm. asked about it a lot. Mm. He's really scared mm. of death, mm-hmm. uh, mainly because he's scared of 
being away from his family. Yeah. Death is like separation from his family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for him, when he, my mom has told him, well, you're going to be with God. You're going to be with Jesus. And for him, that's like, oh, God's going to take me from my family. And, and that actually, it was the <laughs> yeah. opposite reaction she totally. was expecting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he got really bummed and really yeah. frustrated. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Like I, and then, you know, Tim and I have talked a lot about, you know, the point mm. of scripture isn't about life after death, but what happens after life after death. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, in terms of the focus. Yeah, it's not about the afterlife, but the the, fo- the life after. The life, life after. after. <laughs> and that that to Paxton is actually more encouraging because it's like you know Paxton, one day we're all going to be together mm-hmm. and it's going to be uh, like this, but even cooler. And that doesn't answer the question like what happens when I die, but mm. I've tried to <clears throat> try to steer the conversation that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, similar. Yeah, I'm I'm not using the categories heaven and hell to talk about the story with my kids. Um, uh, death is all death is all you need. And that's actually what the biblical authors talk about way more. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that itself is horrible enough. And so uh, what that represents is both something about our mortality but also something about the pain and evil that's in our world. And that one day um, that has been overcome for Jesus and that he's going to do for our world what happened to him, you know, in the resurrection. And I, I, those are the terms I more use. It's just to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The, the binary heaven and hell focus on after your death doesn't match what the apostles focus on in the New Testament. Yeah. And so... Uh, I just I don't think that's going to be a helpful way for our kiddos to get there. Yeah, the focus on heaven is God lives in heaven. There's this other realm that's mm-hmm. not accessible, but not about how we get there one day. Yeah, and yeah. That's the <laughs> yeah, that's the difference we try to focus yeah. on. Yeah, you know, man, I had a really powerful experience with my four year old recently, where he um, is conceiving of death, insects and animals and stuff like that, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he brought it up uh, a few months ago about uh, animals dying. Animals die, yep. I've been using the metaphor for years now about your batteries go out. <laughs> you know, when, when what's happening when, when something dies? Well, its batteries go out. Uh, and then he, I remember the moment he was like, people's batteries go out. Hmm. Then he was just like, uh, mom's batteries will go out hmm. too? Yep my batteries will go out your batteries and he was he was really disturbed yeah yeah and then the sentence that came out of his mouth just blew my mind uh he said that's not love (laughs) wow so profound yeah that's not love and it struck me like because for him to be alive is yeah our family yeah Mm -hmm. and like the love and so for him death means the loss of love and I was just like what he put it better than I could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like the battery thing because it's amazing because they have so many toys with batteries mm-hmm. right? and there's so many things in the house with batteries mm-hmm. that yeah. they just understand it they're That's like right. how do things get powered yeah batteries there's energy and power did they did they go well can we just change the battery <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Batteries? yeah totally yeah so God's love will give a new set of batteries. Yeah. So the love won't go out. Yeah. But. So here's here's a question on that on the new set of batteries thing. Wait, yeah. I've heard this question before. It's always kind of a, it's a hard one to explain, uh, and I don't feel like I've got a good grasp on this. But right, we're t- we're, what you guys are trying to do is tell the whole narrative of of God's story from Genesis to Revelation, God's mm-hmm. redemption of the world back to the way things used to be. Uh, if that's true, and when God restores things the back back to the way that He used or to the way that they used to be, will mm. there be an opportunity for us just to repeat this whole cycle again? Mm. Will, can man choose mm. to turn against God and mm. we start over? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, I, I think I'd want to make one tweak. 
um, and say, I think the story is actually um, God taking the world where it could have gone, but hasn't yet gone before. Hmm. Um, there is a, a certain tradition that's pretty widespread in most, in many forms, at least, of I think Protestant and Catholic Christianity, of the heaven or the new creation is just getting us back to what was perfect and was lost. Mm. We've talked a lot about this actually, yep. mm -hmm. and uh, the problem, the main problem with that is, it's if you really read the first pages of the Bible closely and how the plot conflict is set up, that's not at all the nature of the story. Um, the nature of the story is God creating a great, a good, just use the actual vocabulary, a very good setup that could have become so much more, but didn't. Hmm. And what we currently experience is a subpar form <laughs> of existence that, where our true destiny still remains unrealized. Hmm. So it's more about something that could have gone awesome, no, it's not. And what restoration looks like is restoration to what what could have been and will be possible again. So that's a very different kind of story. Um, and I forget the question. I just wonder. Yeah, could we screw that. it up again? Can, can, oh, can, could we screw it up again? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. I think, well, what, what got screwed up the first time? That humans decided to... Um, that they had a will and a purpose and a way of defining good and evil that they wanted to do by their own wisdom, independent of, of God's wisdom. Genesis 3 is a tale of folly. Not so much rebellion, but a tale of folly. At least that's the vocabulary that's used in the story of wisdom <laughs> and knowledge. Um, and so the whole arc of the storyline of the Bible is... Um, what we need are humans whose will and, and desire completely overlaps with God's will and desire. And it seems to me that's the point of the narratives about Jesus is here's a human whose human will is God's will because he is human and he's God. And then the whole point of the spirit is that through the, God's spirit, he's weaving humans into that new Jesus style humanity. So that my truest humanity in Christ, my will is God's will, and his God's will is my will, at least on a good day. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the picture of the new creation, is the humanity whose will is God's will because God's in, indwelling them by the Spirit, which is better than what was on pages one and two. It's like a new humanity. Yeah. But if you take that to its logical extreme... Yes. Then you kind of become a ton automatons, mm. where mm. it's not my will, it's God's will. So I'm just a vehicle for God's will. I have no yes. will of my own. Co that's correct. And that, and it can't go that far, right? And it yeah. kind of it seems to lose its humanity at that. That's point. right. But yeah. That's, totally. Totally. Yeah. And what what Jesus definitely wasn't was an automaton. But, yeah. Um. He wasn't a robot. So that's. I mean. I, that's what the Gospels are saying, though, is that here's a human whose human will and desire is the divine will. Um, it's both. Right. Um, and whatever Paul's vision about the fruit of the Spirit is, like it's a, it's a way of being human where we naturally exude these things that are divine qualities, of, right? Love, yeah. joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Um, so I, it's the mystery of a human empowered by God's spirit where they're not less human because they're yeah. in line with God's will. It's, it's, tr it's both. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm not saying I experience this on a regular basis. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, but I get a taste of it sometimes. I think when I really am following Jesus and love yeah. my neighbor as myself and it's what I want to do. Yeah. And it's awesome when I do that wish it were more often i remember um a friend of mine years ago we were talking about like writing sci-fi and he said an idea he's had for a sci-fi book or a whole series of books is basically humans exploring the universe in new creation mm -hmm. and that was the first time i really like opened my imagination mm -hmm. to well wait a second exploring the universe 
because when you think about exploring and you think about um, going and, mm-hmm. and doing things that are, mm-hmm. I suppose, could fail or mm-hmm. dangerous or mm-hmm. different things, what makes a good story? Well, conflict. Mm-hmm. So will there be – how do you write a sci-fi novel about mm-hmm. exploring the universe in the new creation without conflict? And what will that conflict look like? Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. so, I mean – yeah. The, the Bible doesn't really tell us necessarily, right? But like, we, mm. but it seems like unless if everything's the, at a perfect state, then there's going to be opportunities yeah. to try things, opportunities to fail, opportunities to yeah. let yourself down, let other people down, yeah. um, have fear and anxiety and, uh, and get, yes. get joy and, and sadness and yeah. excitement, all that stuff. Yeah. Will be part of the experience. Yeah, if the goal was to expand the garden, yeah. humans and God in partnership to cultivate and create yeah. more order and beauty, if that's the purpose that got frustrated, yeah. then that's what's going to... The point yeah. is to get back to that. Right. <laughs> so that exploration and new creative horizons in the universe can yeah. go forward. But it'll need to be some kind of altered universe. Yeah. Well, that Bonds to the resurrection. So, uh, yeah, I think I think I've got like seven station to go. But here's what, <laughs> what we're talking about. No, I think I got like seven hundred more questions that came out of that yeah. answer. <laughs> that's, that's that's why this is that's the whole thing. The story raises the deepest questions. Yeah, about our present and future. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 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 So, so I mean, I really could just keep going on all kinds of fun questions <laughs> to talk about. Did, as a way of kind of wrapping up here, what what are some things you guys are planning on doing in the future, things you're excited about in Bible Project? Mm. We are currently working on a video mm. on God. <laughs> we're going to do a video yeah. on the of God. Yeah, I think we're probably just going to call it God. But it's about the, yeah, the portrait of God's identity throughout the whole story. Um, and it's going to end with the Trinity. But we're not going to start there. Um, we're going to let that idea develop out of the story. And um, I'm really excited. Yeah. We're we're getting close to the final script. And we're going to start to move into production. It's taken us a while. But yeah. I'm, I think I'm really happy with it. Yeah. I'm excited as technology continues to move forward to watch how you guys use technology to continue to share God's story. I, I, I yeah. feeling you guys are going to do well. <laughs> yeah, we're playing around with other things. We're taking our Luke uh, series. We're taking the final week of Jesus in Luke 4 in our five-part series. And we're trying to turn it into a VR experience. Mm. Oh, nice. um, mm. And that's coming along. That's been really fun. Mm-hmm. Um so we're trying we're trying different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but our main our main focus will be this this content library. Yeah, we've got a lot a lot more videos, a lot of theme videos that are retelling the whole story through different angles or different key yeah. motifs. We got a bunch of those. Yeah. Coming out and um, yeah, yeah. A lot. There's yeah. A lot yeah. To do. <laughs> well, you get you mentioned at the beginning that you guys are a nonprofit. So for those of you that didn't the listeners that didn't know that what are some practical ways that they can support the mm-hmm. ministry get behind what you guys are doing well i mean i think first just use the resources um because they're yeah. free because other people already paid for them yeah which is awesome <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's what i tell people too just go to the website or the youtube channel and enjoy yeah and if you start to feel compelled that you want to get behind what we're doing so they can stay free and make even more than yeah if more can be free i yeah like i think what happens is if if it's if it's valuable enough to you uh then you will uh i mean we will ask <laughs> like on the website it's like hey we're raising money so it's not like <laughs> it's not like uh, yeah. you won't see it but at some yeah. point you'll be like you know what this is valuable enough for me i pay ten dollars a month to watch movies on netflix so i'll pay ten dollars a month to mm-hmm. get, make sure these Everyone can watch these, mm-hmm. and a lot of people have, and it's been awesome. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Sweet. so check it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know you guys are uh, dad tired, along with being busy with all the other <laughs> yeah. stuff you got going. Yes. Uh, yeah. So thank you guys seriously for taking the time out to answer some random questions. I appreciate it. Yeah. 
No, yeah. that's great. Yeah, yeah. it's good to, good to talk with you, Jared. Yeah. All right, guys. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, you, you too. too. See you, man.